even in the heart of the world's largest city, there are gardens. But then for many of us, house and garden have become inseparable. Yet this concept has only recently evolved. It's a product of the unprecedented developments of the last 150 years or so. A period that witnessed a complete transformation of the garden and saw the emergence of a new international style. New York, Amsterdam, Copenhagen, suburban London. There's little about the modern garden to tell you where it is. For the most part, these developments took place in Britain. Throughout the 19th century, the English garden was a model to the world. But more than a model, it was a mirror. A mirror that reflected, in a battle of styles, the forces that were so irrevocably changing society. The colonial adventures and cultural struggles, and the advances in science and technology that took place in that era of breathtaking competence. At the beginning of the century, taste was firmly led by the rich and aristocratic. This is Scotney Castle in Kent. The focus of the garden is the ruined 14th century castle. The Stuart villa beside it was partly demolished to create a romantic ruin. Edward Hussey, newly rich from iron ore smelting, built himself a new mansion overlooking it all at a safe distance from the damp. The project was begun in the early years of Queen Victoria's reign, but in a style rapidly becoming old-fashioned. The romantic, the most natural of garden styles, was about to be swept away by the Victorians' boundless enthusiasm for science and technology. This enthusiasm was hinted at in the founding document of the Horticultural Society. Thomas Knight, who was to become the new society's president, wrote, Of all the arts and sciences, horticulture alone appears to have been neglected and left to the common gardener. The Horticultural Society meant to change this state of affairs by publishing papers on topics such as improved methods of plant selection and glasshouse design. During the first few decades of the 19th century, the Horticultural Society grew rapidly and soon began holding competitions amongst the members. The Society started its own garden, first at Kensington, then on a larger scale at Chiswick, where the first flower show was held. The number of people who could claim to be middle class was increasing rapidly. They acquired a taste for gardening, and it was largely their interests which made the new Gardener's Magazine a success. Its founder, or conductor as he called himself, was John Claudius Luden. He was a self-educated Scot and gave his magazine an appropriately high moral tone. It would, he hoped, raise the intellect and character of those engaged in the art. Luden was a prolific writer and through his publication he became the most influential gardener of his time. The style he most appreciated he called gardenesque. It was designed to show off the particular beauties of individual plants, statues and embellishments. This scaled down version of romanticism was just the thing for use in the villa gardens of the middle classes. But still it was the aristocracy who gave the lead. A man like the Earl of Shrewsbury had the wealth and station to act independently. Nevertheless, he did consult Luden about the huge garden he was building for himself. Consulted Luden and then ignored him. Luden hated it. He described the result as being in excessively bad taste, or rather perhaps the work of a morbid imagination joined to the command of unlimited resources. <laughs> 
A traveller passing through Staffordshire in the 1820s would have seen the Earl's project taking shape. Alton Towers is Pugin's remodelling of an old lodge into this extraordinary Gothic pile. In the valley running down from Pugin's building, the 15th Earl himself laid out a comparably grand garden. There is much here that would have been familiar to the Earl's contemporaries, but there are also signs of changes in the air. The Industrial Revolution was reaching into the garden. The magnificent greenhouse is one of the earliest examples on such a scale to use iron for its supporting framework. At the time, it was the largest and finest in Britain. On the other side of the valley stands the Swiss cottage, which housed a blind Welsh harpist installed there to fill the valley with song. The whole conception may have been aristocratic in 18th century, but its execution was distinctly Victorian. Ungainly, and in its enthusiasm for all sorts of new forms, modern. With its eccentric mixture of buildings, statues, waterworks, and its labyrinth of terraces, Alton Towers does seem a bit like a kind of 19th century Disneyland. Its star turn is the pagoda fountain, made of cast iron. It spouts water 70 feet into the air. The man who best showed how to apply the new technology to the old problems was Joseph Paxton. He rose from humble origins to become one of the preeminent men of his age. His genius as an engineer, architect and gardener took him from a gardener's lad to parliament and a knighthood. His career began to ascend when the Duke of Devonshire appointed him head gardener at Chatsworth. Paxton was just 23 years old. He arrived at Chatsworth at 4.30 a.m. one May morning in 1826, climbed over the wall and explored the gardens. They'd been in the making for 300 years, but had become run down. At 6 a.m. he set his men to work and went to have breakfast for the housekeeper and her niece. Paxton and the niece immediately fell in love, and thus, he wrote, completed my first morning's work at Chatsworth before 9 o'clock. The garden already boasted this grand 17th century cascade and Paxton set about designing spectacles to match it. He constructed a huge reservoir on the high escarpment overlooking the house. From here the water falls 380 feet down through pipes that gradually narrow, building up to an enormous pressure. The result is the Emperor Fountain. Designed to rise almost 300 feet, it's the highest gravity-fed fountain in the world. The fountain had been intended to impress the Emperor of Russia who did not, in the end, come to Chatsworth. In another part of the garden, Paxton assembled these huge boulders. They look so natural that it's easy to underestimate the engineering skill needed to position each of the enormous stones. This largest group, the water comes from a pipe, was named in honour of the hero of the day, the Duke of Wellington. <laughs> 
Engineering genius though he was, Paxton's creations were often romantic in their effect. He built this ruined aqueduct to feed the cascade. Paxton also built these beautiful wall cases in cast iron and glass. They provide protection from the bleak winds of the Derbyshire moors for citrus fruit and delicate shrubs such as camellias. But of all the wonders he created at Chatsworth, without doubt the one his contemporaries most admired, stood on this site. Above these foundations, 277 feet long, there once rose the glittering glass vault of the great conservatory. Here it stood like a huge jewel until it was demolished after the Great War as an austerity measure. Technically, it was a huge advance over the glass house at Alton Towers. Wellington thought it the most wonderful thing he'd ever seen. Inside, Paxton grew an outstanding range of exotic and rare plants from all over the world. Queen Victoria and Prince Albert drove through the building in their carriage one December evening to see the wonders for themselves. Soon, 48,000 people each year were visiting Chatsworth. And it was here at Chatsworth that Victoria Regia, the giant water lily, first flowered in England. The Duke of Devonshire was so excited by the news that he sped home from Ireland to see it and had the flower cut and sent as a present to the Queen. And Paxton found that he could learn something of engineering from the lily. He realized that its structure gave it great strength. He then applied the same principle in the roof of the glass house they built to protect the lily. The lily house, with most of Paxton's other iron and glass buildings at Chatsworth, have gone. But the other great glass house of the period remains, the Palm House at Kew. It was designed by Decimus Burton, who'd helped to build the conservatory at Chatsworth. The Palm House was even bigger, 326 feet long, and since its completion in 1848, it has remained one of the sites of London. The palm house boasted the latest methods of ventilation and heating. Hot water passing through pipes and warm air rising up from the floor grids proved ideal for the plants. Lest the eye of the admiring visitor be distracted by a glimpse of the workmen who'd made the whole thing function, the fuel for the boilers was transported as at Chatsworth by a small underground railway. The collection of exotic plants was as spectacular as the building. Commercial species too were raised and studied here in ideal conditions. When shipped to suitable parts of the empire, they were grown for the profit of the British businessman and ultimately the enjoyment of the British consumer. But cocoa, coffee, and particularly rubber have become everyday commodities is due in part to this building at Kew. The Victorians' love of rare and exotic plants was one aspect of their almost obsessively inquiring spirit. Many regions of the world were first explored by plant hunters. Expeditions were financed by institutions such as Kew or by rich patrons like the Duke of Devonshire. League nurserymen also sent out parties. There were, after all, fortunes to be made when a newly discovered plant caught the popular imagination. The search for new specimens often involved real hardship and danger in remote and hostile environments. David Douglas worked mainly on the west coast of America, where he made one of the greatest botanical collections ever. 
For ten years, he survived every possible setback and danger, only to die in the comparative safety of Hawaii, where he fell into a pit containing a wild bull. His work is commemorated in the names of many plants, the Douglas fir, for instance, and his introductions completely altered the winter scene in Europe. The Victorians particularly appreciated these new evergreen trees. Britain has only three native species and began collections of them in the bigger gardens. Here their great variety of form and colour could be studied and enjoyed all the year round. One of the most popular and one which most clearly stands out was the giant Californian redwood or Wellingtonia. The largest known tree, it grows almost 300 feet high. Everyone wanted to have one and were not put off by the fact that it would take about 3,000 years to mature. These redwoods thrive in Britain and already tower above the native trees. Another man whose introductions helped to alter the look of our gardens was Sir Joseph Hooker, a director of Kew. In his younger days, he climbed to over 19,000 feet in the Himalayas to collect many of the rhododendrons which were finding such favour in Europe. Robert Fortune collected in the Far East. His introductions include varieties of cherry, azalea and chrysanthemum. It was he who smuggled the jealously guarded tea plant out of China to establish the tea industry in India. He almost lost his life at the hands of Chinese pirates. At a time when it took months of difficult sea travel to visit the tropics, sights such as these were like glimpses of another planet. When the Reverend E. Duke announced that his giant American aloe had, after a hundred years, actually flowered, 1,500 people were attracted to his garden near Salisbury. The visitors could climb to the platform for a closer inspection of the 27-foot high flower. After its single flowering, the aloe is so exhausted that the plant dies. The problem of keeping plants alive on the long voyage home was solved by Nathaniel Bagshaw Ward. He invented the Wardian case, a sealed glass container that protected the specimens from both the extremes of climate and the salt sea air. These cases could boast an unprecedented 90% survival rate. In the home, decorative models were used to make indoor gardens in the smoky Victorian living rooms. When the prohibitive tax on glass was repealed in 1845, the sale of glass houses increased. This made it possible for many more people to rear the exotic new plants. At the same time, cheap methods of making glass sheets of uniform thickness were developed. This did away with the magnifying glass effect that could burn plants. We can thank Thomas Budding for this invention. The Victorians expressed their enthusiasm for technical innovations and new plants by developing a style of design to show them off. Trentham in Staffordshire set the fashion. Here the Duke of Sunderland used his new wealth based on coal to build this garden in the Italianate style. It combined a formal architectural layout with rigid geometrical flower beds. At Trentham, it took 35 gardeners to bed out 120,000 plants twice a year. The display lasted for just a few months. For the rest of the year, there was nothing but the severe architectural outline. But for those months, the Duke was up in town. Both the house and garden at Trentham were designed by Sir Charles Barry. His best known building was a collaboration with Putin. It's Gothic in style, but Barry himself preferred the classical Italian. Shrublands Hall, for instance, in Suffolk. As at Trentham, 
Barry was assisted in the garden by William Nesfield, a specialist in parterres. The garden's main feature, a bold theatrical gesture, is behind this elegant pavilion. Barry took the Villa d'Este near Rome as his model. House guests were left in no doubt about the wealth and standing of their host. Expensive, grand, designed to impress. This too is a garden dominated by architecture. Now, with just three gardeners to do the work, the bedding here has all but disappeared. In its heyday, Shrublands was renowned for its lavish schemes, but in those days there were 30 gardeners. Bedding out was the garden craze of the mid-19th century. Exotic, brilliantly coloured annuals, mass produced by the thousands in glass houses, planted out in intricate patterns. Garish primary colours were used almost exclusively. These gardens were meant to display the wealth of those who could afford the plants, the manpower and necessary equipment. And to the Victorian mind, they also demonstrated man's control over nature. These days, the style can still be seen in a reduced form in municipal parks and seaside towns, where it survives in private gardens. The colours and patterns used are simpler and more restrained. This terrace at Tutton Park, now a National Trust property, is the work of Sir Joseph Paxton. Paxton's career was a model of the Victorian virtues of industry and ingenuity and he was duly rewarded with his knighthood in 1851 after designing the Great Exhibition Building. When the Crystal Palace was re-erected and enlarged on a new site in South London, Paxton designed a spectacular garden to go in front of it. Close to the building there were formal Italian terraces and waterworks even more elaborate than those at Chatsworth. The water towers that fed the fountains were designed by another famous 19th century engineer, Isambard Kingdom Brunel. The lower part of the garden was less formal. The large statues of prehistoric monsters, which still remain today, were not gimmicks, but part of the serious educational purpose of the garden. A similarly Victorian seriousness of intention underlies this garden in Staffordshire, Bidolph Grange. To walk about this garden was to take a small world tour. It was meant to edify the visitor as well as surprise and delight him. The wit and imagination of this garden singles it out from others of the period Though even here there are terraces near the house, but the formal style was too expensive to last. The last major garden in this style was made for the Royal Horticultural Society in 1861 at South Kensington. It was largely the work of William Nesfield. He used coloured earths and gravels for some of the patterning to overcome the starkness of winter. <laughs> 
Though the garden delighted Prince Albert, reaction to this foreign way of doing things was on the way. Not everyone thought that industrialization was an unqualified blessing. The arts and crafts movement started speaking up for the old traditional ways. In the garden, this meant restoring the neglected plants. But it was the author of this bestseller who was the most persuasive. William Robinson, like Luden, whom he so much admired, was essentially a writer. Robinson was something of a revolutionary, fighting for the romantic style of gardening that had once existed and had been lost in the welter of innovations. There would be no more torturing of plants into rigid formality for him. Instead, herbaceous plants and bulbs, climbers and ramblers, winter flowers and woodland plants, all given space to grow naturally. Here was a garden for all seasons. Apart from anything else, this type of garden had a strong practical appeal. With the cost of labour continually rising, a man could do very well with just four gardeners. But Robinson did not reject the imported plants. Indeed, another type of wild garden was already evolving out of necessity, the woodland garden. This is Leonard's Lee in Sussex. When it was made, many new varieties of rhododendrons and azaleas were arriving in Europe and being hybridized. These large flowering shrubs needed considerable space. To find it, gardeners turned to the native woodland. It was said at the time that the money spent on rhododendrons over 20 years would have paid off the national debt. Of the many enthusiasts who took up Robinson's ideas, it was this woman, steeped in the arts and crafts movement, who developed them into a really distinctive style. Gertrude Jekyll could turn her hand to pottery, woodwork, painting, even photography. But when in middle age her eyesight began to fail, she devoted the rest of her long life to gardening. Through her series of now classic books and the design of over 200 gardens, she showed how to organize vast numbers of native and imported plants in natural yet controlled ways. Using her painter's eye and an extensive knowledge of plants, she harmonized color and texture, size and shape, giving each plant space to grow naturally in groups that blended into each other. Her speciality was the herbaceous border. This change in style marked the beginnings of a new way of using gardens. Now they became the place to indulge in an activity, gardening. Much of Gertrude Jekyll's later work was done with Edwin Lutyens, who was beginning to make his name as an architect. The garden at Hestercombe House was completed in 1910. Lutyen's strong architectural outlines are softened by Miss Jekyll's subtle planting. The result is like a series of carefully composed pictures. For many of us, it seems like the quintessence of a sort of ideal England. By the 1920s, Sir Edwin Lutyens had become the most famous British architect of his time. He'd been involved in the building of Hampstead Garden Suburb, one of the last attempts to design a whole environment based on the ideal of a garden. But over the years, he'd moved away from his arts and craft background and was designing such symbols of national feeling as the Cenotaph in Whitehall and the Viceroy's Palace in New Delhi. 
One of Sir Edwin's later buildings stands on the edge of Dartmoor overlooking the Devon countryside. Although it was begun in 1910, work dragged on until well after the Great War. It was built for Julius Drew, not an aristocrat, but a man who'd made a fortune when he founded the home and colonial stores. Castle Drogo is the last great country house to have been built in Britain. Hidden from it, alone and separate, is Lutyens Garden. The main area is similar in size and shape to Hestercum. But there the similarities end. Here the geometrical lines are simplified in keeping with Lutyens' enthusiasm for the neoclassical. The climax of the garden is austere. Not a single ornament or flower disturbs the lines of this huge circular lawn. Throughout the period that the gardens at Hestercum and Drogo were being made, a garden which has been called the most influential British garden of the century was taking shape at Hidcote Manor in Gloucestershire. Lawrence Johnston, an ex-army man of independent means, spent 30 years developing a bare, unpromising site. This he divided with hedges, creating vistas and a large formal lawn. Yet within this formal structure, hidden by the hedges, are a sequence of small individual gardens, quite independent of each other, but linked by a series of paths and steps. It gives Hidgut an intimate and accessible quality, a sense of discovery and surprise. Johnson drew freely from all sorts of historical styles. The classical Italian and classical French coexist along with English features. The idea of a single colour garden is taken up in the red border. Because Hidcote is composed of so many different elements, there's something here for everyone. Where many people found it difficult to relate their own garden to the grand designs of other eras, the small intimate areas at Hidcote could be used as a model. By this time, there were small gardens by the million. The 19th century had created the social pressures and growing wealth to improve living standards. It created the ideal of a house and garden for everyone. The dense, gardenless Victorian cities were soon being encircled by the new suburbs, mile upon mile of home each with its own small plot of land. But what could be done with these rectangles with houses in the middle? In Britain, the owners of these new gardens were happy to follow traditional models, the cottage gardens of an idealized past or the garden rooms of Hidcote. It brought a touch of country into the town With British gardeners content to potter about in the old ways, the initiative in garden design crossed the Atlantic. America became the inheritor of the wealth and competence that was Britain's in the 19th century. They had the space to build from scratch and were not overburdened by tradition. 
Cities like Los Angeles are wholly 20th century creations. These gardens enjoy a different climate, but share a few problems with those of their harder up cousins in Surrey. Land and labor are expensive. Even the very rich can't spread out in the old grand manner. But for all that, they're gardens that are meant to impress. They did this at first by using a cheerful mixture of traditional European styles. But that didn't seem quite enough. Soon there was an attempt to reflect what in a way was a new lifestyle. When the new aristocracy of film stars built their homes and gardens, the studio publicity machine told America and the world all about it. A new garden style based on a sort of Hollywood baroque provided the settings for a world of glamour and romance. Many of the artists who came over from the old world were attracted to the film studios. They spread an enthusiasm for the modern movements in art and architecture, which were soon introduced into the better healed gardens of the 30s. Thomas Church, a native-born Californian, liked the new methods. In his gardens, he began to bring together all the new ideas that were in the air. He built an influential garden amid the curving hills to the north of San Francisco. He repeated the shape of those hills throughout his garden, and so it fits in with the surrounding countryside. Central to the plan is the feature that was coming to be thought of as essential. Church's pool was one of the first to get away from the usual rectangular shape, and a whole generation of pools followed suit. What makes this garden remarkable is the thinking behind the design. The garden shows the influence of the revolutionary principles that architects like Frank Lloyd Wright and Le Corbusier were applying to their buildings in the 30s. Function should dictate shape. Because gardeners are expensive, plants needing a lot of attention have been eliminated. This garden is cleared for action. It's for eating in, relaxation, parties. It's a garden for living in. It's an approach which has proved irresistible. The backyards of millions of American suburban houses are now extensions of the living area, outdoor rooms. This one is at Laguna Beach, Southern California. The plants may be exotic, but they're tough. They look after themselves, and again, the main feature is functional. The functional garden for outdoor living wasn't just irresistible to America. It came back across the Atlantic. This large villa garden owned by Americans is in the south of France. There's plenty of room here for the good old traditional devices for making an effect. But the division between the house and garden has been broken down. The owners here have got the money and the climate to bring it off in the grand style. But even in the freezingly inappropriate climate of Northern Europe, the same idea is catching on. And just because a garden is functional and easy to maintain, it doesn't mean you can't experiment a bit. In his own house, Karl Plomin, a leading German garden architect, goes to town on plants and vegetation encouraged to grow naturally. His is a romantic garden, in the tradition of Scotney Castle and Leonardsley. 
garden he's built for his next-door neighbour reminds one of nothing so much as the most austere forms of modern art. It's a formal garden, dominated by architecture, designed in the rigid straight lines and rectangles of the international style. But although it's modern, there are echoes here of Trentham and Shrublands. Since the war, this formal style has been much in vogue for huge projects like the Barbican. It's a high-rise, high-density estate in the heart of the city of London. 4,000 residents share these raised garden beds, lakes and waterfalls. It's as formal and architecturally severe as anything Barry or Nesfield ever came up with. In summer, there are barely enough plants to soften the concrete and bricks. In winter, there are none. But even in winter, a garden like this looks pretty good. It's in Copenhagen. In summer, it's an outdoor room. Instead of having a lawn, the ground is covered with pebbles, rocks and brick. It not only survives the winter snow, but you hardly have to touch it. Whereas a garden like Biddulph Grange was a riot of exotic reminders of other parts of the world, this is somehow a very Scandinavian adaptation of the Japanese idea of creating a complete but scaled down model of the natural world. It's austere, refined. Near the Elbe, in the leafy outskirts of Hamburg, is this house and garden. You won't get a better example of the modern garden than the one Karl Plomin built for the owner of a chain of restaurants. Home and garden blend into each other and both are part of the landscape. Cheap to run, functional, undemanding, yet still it allows nature to have the upper hand. And yet it's not to everyone's taste. Has it all become a bit too perfect, too introspective? The modern garden is a place which shuts out the world. The old 19th century garden was a bit more welcoming than this. This garden makes even fewer concessions. It's perhaps the only totally new type of garden this century. It's a specialist garden run by the Free University of Amsterdam and it's an ecological garden. Far from importing exotic specimens as the Victorian plant hunters did, the idea is to preserve all Holland's native plants, including the weeds. This reverence for the natural, for what at any rate appears to flourish without much help from man, makes it, oddly enough, fearfully expensive to build and maintain but it's not the sort of place most people would make an effort to visit. And today, gardening is the most popular of all pastimes. Exhibitions like the annual show held by the Royal Horticultural Society since 1913 at Chelsea attract huge crowds. People come to see the latest in plants, equipment and design and to get a few ideas for their own gardens. And these days people are more curious than ever about other people's gardens, particularly gardens with a grandeur of scale and some personality to them. Chatsworth, Idcote and perhaps the most popular of all the great English gardens, Sissinghurst Castle in Kent. It was the work of Vita Sackville West and her junior partner in garden making, her husband Harold Nicholson. She was the daughter of a lord, and apart from being a novelist, she was a gardening correspondent to a London newspaper. He was a diplomat, an anti-appeasement MP, and a diarist. 
They began a new garden in 1930 around a complex of ancient manor buildings. There are many separate spaces and enclosures linked by views, alleys, steps and arches. In each, Vita Sackville West grew a profusion of plants, lovingly chosen and skillfully grouped. Although only the 20th century could have produced it, Sissinghurst looks about as traditional as you can imagine. There are some formal features, but the garden as a whole is a triumph of the natural, romantic style. That's the style in the end which the English seem to like best. The National Trust, who run it now, are embarrassed by the popularity of Sissinghurst. It attracts thousands of visitors every year. How Luden, Robinson and Miss Jekyll would have loved it. But what of the future? Well, one thing is sure, gardens evolved slowly. It took more than 20 years to create Sissinghurst. Society will continue to change, but the urge to garden runs deep and people will go on making gardens and those gardens of the future will reflect, as do ours, the society which creates them. And you! Thanks for trying to be a jerk. Oh. A midnight movie later on is The Killing, the story of an ex-convict who plans an audacious multi-million dollar racecourse robbery. Sterling Hayden stars in this Stanley Kubrick thriller tonight at...